It's always fun doing that. So we're either early or late, depending on which clock you look at in here. So we're going to split the difference on it. Well, we'd like to welcome everybody to our luncheon today. Uh, I think we're going to have a great presentation, so we're excited about this. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Enjoyed the lunch. A uh, few announcements. Um, we're looking to have our field trip for the Utah Geosites October 25th and 26th. We'll get a registration going up on the website so you can register there. It's going to be an overnighter. That's what everybody told me they wanted was an overnighter, so we'll be doing that. Um, so we'll get that up, uh, but plan on that. I think it's going to be pretty good. Uh, we've also got the, uh, the UGA and the AWG Family Fun Weekend out there at Dinosaur National Park, August 9th through the 11th. So put that on your calendar. Um, the registration is up on the website for that as well. So there'll be presentations that night. The campgrounds are reserved. Uh, we'll be having a, a meal that night as well. So come and enjoy yourself with that one. I think they're planning on uh, possibly rafting the river uh, that Saturday or Sunday. Lucy, are you here? Sunday. Sunday? Okay. Yeah, that'll be a pretty good trip. So come to that if you can. We got the golf tournament scheduled September 13th. It's a Friday at Stonebridge. Is that in West Valley? Okay, that's Stonebridge, West Valley. It started at 8 o'clock in the morning. So uh, we're looking for sponsors and people to sign up for that. So teams, individuals, however you want to do it. Please go to the website, it'll be available there, and let's get signed up for that. It'll be a, a fun event there. And we're also starting the call for nominations for the Lehigh Hensey Award. So uh, think through that and start uh, making your nominations for the Lehigh Hensey Award, if you would, please. So we're going to start that right there. Let's see. <clears throat> um, I think that's all I have. Is there anything else? We've got lots of students here today. We're glad you're here. Welcome here. We'd also like to encourage you to join the UGA if you'd like to. It's pretty cheap for students. So, well, it's pretty cheap for everybody, but particularly students. So, uh, we'd like to encourage you to join up and uh, get all these wonderful benefits from membership from the UGA. Um, Leslie, anything else? You can submit papers if you have any for next year's. Yes. Paper. Yes. On um, mining, sustainable mining, and anything new in oil and gas, how we're doing it better than has been done in the past. We'd really like to educate more people on that. It would be great to have a volume. That's good. Okay. Think about a paper for that if you could. It would be good to have as well. Uh, that's all I have. Is there anything else from our members that we need to talk about, discuss? Okay. Craig, we'll turn the time over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Schlinker, Program Chair. And I'll let today's speaker introduce the title of uh, his presentation. Today's speaker is Brendan Quirk. Uh, Brendan recently completed his PhD in geology at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. <clears throat> Brendan's research interests focus on using glacial landforms and cave recordings to understand past climate changes, dating and investigating hazards associated with large ancient landslides, and application of cosmogenic nucleides to landscape evolution. <clears throat> Brendan spent several years as a geologic consultant after graduating from the State University of New York, Genesco. Before traveling out west to Utah for graduate school, he recently accepted a postdoctoral research position at the University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst, where he will be exploring new applications of cosmic, uh, cosmogenic isotopes. Let's welcome Brendan. Okay, thanks everyone for coming out today. Uh, is that good? Everyone can hear me in the back. We're good. 
Okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the problems I've been working on uh, as part of my PhD for the last five years, uh, focusing on understanding both glacier and climate change uh, in our very own Wasatch Mountains of Utah uh, during the late Pleistocene, early Holocene. And I think a really good place to start is with how glaciers have really come to be viewed as sort of the sentinels of climate change. And so I think some of the starkest examples of this uh, come from observations in the modern. Uh, here, I'm showing a photograph of the Grinnell Glacier in Glacier National Park in the early 20th century. And using repeat photography, here is that same glacier in 2016, showing dramatic ice loss and glacier retreat. And so this trend of uh, retreating glaciers and, and ice loss is, with few exceptions, uh, broadly consistent across the globe. Here I'm showing you uh, a plot from Orlman's 2005 seminal paper uh, with relative glacier length on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Uh, and we can see sort of a precipitous, uh, rather rapid retreat or a, a, a shortening of glacier lengths throughout the modern. And it's because of this sensitivity to climate change, and in particular uh, to temperature change shown on the left-hand plot there, uh, that Earth scientists use the geologic record of ancient glaciations to understand past climate changes. And so uh, throughout this talk, I'm gonna be uh, uh, is the moraines at the mouths of uh, Little Cottonwood and Bell's Canyons, as well as Pleistocene uh, lake shorelines, such as those from, from Lake Bonneville, and both of which provide really good uh, records or snapshots of past climate states. Um, and additionally, we also have uh, pretty abundant cave records, such as those investigated here at Timpanogos Cave National Monument, which provide sort of a, a complementary but continuous descriptor of climate change. And so, you know, I'm not the first person to do this. Uh, researchers have been developing climate proxy records for well over a century uh, in Western North America. And recently, Oster and others in 2015 uh, compiled this proxy record network, uh, specifically uh, uh, looking at hydroclimate change or changes in the distribution of water and evaporation, things like that, uh, for Western North America during the LGM. And then they compared what that proxy record network said, what it, what it was saying about the past climate state. They compared that to general circulation model output uh, for the LGM. And what Oster and others found was that GCMs that best matched the proxy records in Western North America showed a precipitation dipole with a drier northern Western North America and a wetter uh, southern Western North America during the last glacial maximum. And here's sort of the blue tones are wetter, uh, the red tones are drier. And each of those dots represents a, uh, a proxy record location uh, with green being good agreement with, with modeling uh, and red being poor agreement. Now you might have noticed uh, that they found that uh, records in the northern uh, Great Basin showed uh, pronounced uh, disagreement with modeling uh, or, yeah, with GCM results. And so we sort of took this as motivation to re-examine some of the previously developed um, uh, proxy records in this region as well as developing some of our own to really understand what was going on in the northern Great Basin during the LGM uh, through uh, into the Holocene. Okay, so with all that in mind, uh, my talk today is broken up into three different parts. The first one, I'm just gonna be describing how, and, and as well as some of the results uh, of, of discerning the glacial chronology in the Wasatch Range. In part two, I'm gonna focus on how we use those glacial records to reconstruct ancient climate. And in the third talk, I'll share some of the, the initial results we have from developing climate records from Timpanogos Cave National Monument. 
Okay, so in the first part of this talk, uh, I'm gonna outline how we determined uh, the range-wide glacial history um, and sort of share those results in both a regional as well as a global context, what it all means. And then I'll also try to make some initial paleoclimate inferences based solely on the space-time pattern of glaciation in the Wasatch alone. So the basic concept uh, of what we did is, or at least the first part, is we want to be able to reconstruct uh, ancient glacier shapes. Um, and uh, the way we do this is, is by mapping glacial features uh, throughout the canyon. Uh, we map things like trim lines, striated bedrock, uh, the distribution of uh, valley morphologies, you know, sort of classic U-shaped canyons, uh, indications of, of, of glaciation. And what's particularly important is, is mapping terminal and lateral moraines near the ice margins, because this really delineates uh, how far or the maximum extent of past glaciations. And so by combining all of this mapping, So uh, yeah, so a, a trim line would just be sort of that you kind of have to infer it uh, most of the times, but the area sort of, if you imagine uh, the thickness of a glacier where it's eroded into the canyon, um, uh, where above it, uh, glacial erosion has not affected it. So that line separating non-glacial and glacial, we would refer to as a trim line. So uh, they, they can be, but um, not, not always. It's a good question, yeah. Um, and so when we combine all of that mapping, we can reconstruct uh, an ancient glacier shape. Here, I'm showing you an example of Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, in the black outline here, I'm showing you the mapped last glacial maximum ice extent uh, for Little Cottonwood Canyon. And now we can do this uh, for multiple uh, uh, glacier shapes, uh, or we can map uh, glacial deposits with clear stratigraphic or morphostratigraphic relationships. And the idea here is we can reconstruct uh, a changing glacier shape through time. And so here in red, I've shown you, or I'm showing you, uh, the mapped outline for a, a late glacial uh, position or glacier shape in Little Cottonwood Canyon uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, that's strongly denoted or, or um, uh, we've mapped uh, based on, if I can show you this, uh, a terminal moraine just at the ice margin here at Hogham Fork. So again, the idea is we can use these, these changing glacier shapes through time to understand climate change through time. And so uh, it's probably, uh, or it might be apparent that being able to map moraines uh, effectively uh, and really accurately um, is really important to uh, determining these ice marginal positions. And this is made quite a bit easier in the Wasatch uh, due to the availabil availability to uh, between two and half meter LIDAR for much of the Wasatch range. And here as an example, I'm showing you hillshade images of Dry Creek Canyon, kind of near the, uh, the mouth front um, on the left-hand side and further up valley on the right-hand side. And, and Dry Creek, uh, just for reference, is located, or this Dry Creek, because there's a thousand of them in Utah. Um, <laughs> Uh, is located just above uh, the town of Alpine uh, in Utah County. And uh, so here I'm showing you a hillshade image of uh, 10 meter national elevation data set data, which previously was sort of the, the highest uh, resolution available. And when we, com let me just figure this out. Okay. And when we compare that to, uh, to LIDAR data, it becomes readily apparent that there's sort of a, a rich uh, history of, of glaciation preserved at each of these sites. Um, here on the, the left-hand side at the Dry Creek Terminal Moraine, uh, we actually see uh, evidence of, of uh, multiple glacier positions preserved in the form of, of multiple nested glacial uh, uh, moraine sequences. And then um, further up valley at the, the Dry Creek Recessional position, uh, small amplitude uh, recessional moraines, which by and large were previously unmapped, become readily apparent. Um, and, and this is really what allowed us to sort of uh, expediently map these, these recessional uh, positions. And 
Just to make it a little bit clearer, I've outlined the marine crests, or at least some of them, uh, in these dashed red lines to help you guys see. See if I can get this to work. Um, I think it's it's kind of hard to get a sense for what these landforms really look like and what what the scale of them are just from looking at hillshade images alone. So I've included this drone video footage if I can get it to work um, to give you guys that that sort of sense. Okay. So here we're looking at Little Cottonwood Canyon, sort of panning over to the left lateral moraine um, area and kind of looking across into Bells Canyon. In this shot here, we're just flying into the Bells, Bells Canyon Terminal Moraine Complex. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with these deposits. Um, and here I'm just showing you an example of sort of a typical boulder-rich deposit uh, at, at Bells Canyon uh, that in fact we, we dated. Um, and, and this shot I, I really like. So again, this is at the mouth of Dry Creek Canyon. And we can see from afar that, you know, in sort of the center of the screen here, we're looking at sort of a boulder-rich ridge that could be sort of a, a, a moraine that we're looking at. But as we zoom in closer, we can actually really start to make out that we're looking at two distinct sort of lines of boulders. And in fact, when we compare that to the LIDAR, um, it shows up as a nested moraine sequence. So we can sort of verify what we're seeing in the LIDAR uh, uh, from field evidence. And obviously it really helps with a drone. Okay, so um, we spend quite a bit of time mapping all of these deposits. Um, but one of the main goals for this, it's part knowing what the glacier shapes were, but then also when were the glaciers at these positions. And so in order to do that, uh, we use a technique called cosmogenic surface exposure dating. And this technique in, in relatively simple terms, it, it takes advantage of the production of relatively rare isotopes in earth surface materials exposed near the earth's surface. And now, if we can measure the concentration of those isotopes, and we know the rate at which those isotopes are produced, we've effectively set up a clock or a chronometer to determine how long a particular uh, Earth surface material, in this case rock, has been exposed at the Earth's surface. And so, uh, what we end up doing is we go out to... Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you an example of sampling boulders deposited on the crests of moraines. We go out and we collect samples from the tops of these, these boulders. Um, and we can also uh, uh, do this at, um, not at, at, at places of deposition, but also uh, erosional features, uh, such as this uh, striated bedrock at Lake Blanche. I have the pen here oriented along the long axis of, of glacial striations. And again, we can measure the concentration of those, those rare isotopes and determine how long this rock has been exposed near the surface. And what's important to remember is that when I'm talking about um, an exposure age, a cosmogenic exposure age, in both of these cases, whether I'm dating a moraine or striated bedrock, it indicates the time of glacier retreat from these positions. So I'm not telling you when these glaciers arrived or culminated at these positions, but when they abandoned either uh, a moraine or when they moved past uh, a bedrock position. So that's just sort of important to keep in mind. So, uh, We've done this sort of mapping and dating campaign across the Wasatch. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you a map of sort of the central Wasatch area with uh, each of those boxes uh, indicating an area where we've uh, both mapped and collected samples uh, from glacial features for cosmogenic surface exposure dating. And the goal here, um, I should really stress, was to develop a range-wide chronology, not just focusing on a single canyon. And the reason we do this is that if we can determine that the range was responding or, or glaciers were moving or retreating uh, synchronously across the range, it's a better indicator that it was responding to uh, a broad-scale sort of climate uh, phenomena as opposed to... Um, just sort of ice dynamic effects or local climate effects. Um, and so uh, for the bulk of my talk today, I'm gonna to be focusing on the last two items here, uh, 
uh, the last glacial maximum and, as well as uh, late glacial stadia in the Wasatch. Uh, but I think it's important to note that uh, we were able to determine um, the first sort of uh, proper glacial age for the penultimate deglaciation in the Wasatch um, around 132,000 years ago. And you can find more information about that in a 2018 GSA bulletin paper um, uh, where we spend a lot more time discussing that. Okay, so here are some of the results uh, from that mapping and dating campaign. Here I'm showing you a plot with normalized glacier length on the y-axis, age on the x-axis. I have Wasatch moraines in red, uh, Western North America moraine ages in black, as well as uh, a global moraine data set in gray. And bedrock ages are shown in triangles and follow the same exact color scheme. And uh, not that provocative of a result, uh, in sort of a, a broad scale um, comparison, Wasatch, uh, or the, the chronology of Wasatch glaciation and deglaciation generally seems to follow or isn't that dissimilar from Western North America in particular, but also global data sets of deglaciation. So moving into uh, more of a, a, a local story, um, I'm showing you a hydrograph of Lake Bonneville um, with age on the x-axis, um, adjusted altitude for adjusted for isostatic rebound on the right-hand y-axis, and that that A curve there. I'm sure most of you recognize it. It's a uh, updated hydrograph um, for Lake Bonneville, and these these humps here. Uh, I'm showing you are, you can think of them as probability density functions for glacial landform ages. And they correspond to this normalized frequency on the left-hand y-axis. And so uh, the main takeaway here is that um, our new data suggests that um, unlike previously, uh, glaciers in the Wasatch appear to have reached their maxima uh, extent prior to the Bonneville high stand, so during sort of the proper LGM phase. Um, and then, again, remembering that these ages represent retreat from these positions, abandoned those terminal positions around 20,000 years ago. Um, but then we also see evidence for a, a near maxima re-advance sort of in sync uh, with the Lake Bonneville high stand or, or just thereabouts. Um, and then we also seem to see sort of rapid deglaciation uh, sort of in phase with abandonment from the, uh, insofar as we know it, uh, the abandonment from the Provo uh, level. Okay, so this is a, a bit of a, a busy plot, so I'll, I'll walk you right through it. I'm showing you again age on the x-axis. And the red curve on top in A is a temperature reconstruction for Western North America. Um, the black curve, I'm showing you summer insulation at 40 degrees north. Uh, in panel B, I'm showing you those Wasatch uh, moraine ages. Again, just uh, you can think of those as probability density functions. And then in panel C, I'm on the y-axis, I'm showing you uh, normalized glacier length with uh, uh, Wasatch uh, glaciers shown in green and sort of select um, Western North America glacial records in gray. And then on the last panel here in the dashed black line, again, just showing you a uh, hydrograph for Lake Bonneville. And then what I'm also showing you, sort of the, the new thing here is uh, a probability density function for the ages of Western North America pluvial lakes uh, during the Pleistocene. And these are a really good indicator of, of past hydroclimate changes, uh, just because lakes are, especially when compared to glaciers, are particularly sensitive to changes in precipitation uh, and also uh, evaporation. And so from this, just from looking at the space-time pattern uh, of, of glaciation compared to these other records, um, it seems to suggest that LGM glacier culmination was driven by reduced temperatures as well as insulation and probably not that much change in precipitation as indicated by the lack of sort of a notable spike in uh, Western North America pluvial lakes. Um, glaciers appear to have re-advanced synchronously with lakes uh, during this sort of uh, 17,000 Ka period, uh, suggesting an increased moisture source during this time. So we have a sort of transition there. And then finally, uh, retreat from those, those positions 
um, until what I'm calling, you know, air quote, final deglaciation to high cirque positions around 15,000 years ago. Okay, so now we think we have a good guess for the the, the shapes of glaciers and when they were at these these uh, these different positions. And so now in a more sort of um, uh, acute way, we want to use these records to reconstruct uh, climate change. And the way we do this is using um, numerical modeling techniques that include energy mass balance and ice flow modeling. And so the, again, the, I'm using Little Cottonwood Canyon as an example. The main concept here is to basically invert glacier shape for climate. If we know the shape, we should be able to solve for, um, uh, for climates that could have produced them. And so what we end up doing is we, we grow this glacier from scratch by varying climate. Um, and then we try to match that to the known or our mapped ice extent. And then from all of our dating, um, uh, we know uh, when glaciers were at this position. And so we can grow these glaciers, sort of fill the, uh, um, the valley and try to match these, uh, these glacier shapes. And we can do this process for multiple glacier shapes through time and therefore reconstruct climate through time, or at least that's the idea. Okay, so um, this is a, a sort of flow chart schematic of the, the modeling process. Um, and, and in fact, uh, we rely on two separate but uh, sort of semi-coupled models. The first being an, an energy mass balance model where what we try to do is simulate all the physical processes that lead to or account for the distribution of snow accumulation and snow melt on a uh, elevation surface. And so the sort of the main inputs into the EMB model are descriptions of climate, as well as description of changes in um, uh, uh, solar angles. Um, so that's accounting for things like Milankovitch cycles, and then a, 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 um, a description of topography in the glaciated uh, region. Feeding that into the energy mass balance model, we get a description of snow accumulation and ablation on this, uh, this elevation surface. And we use that mass balance description alongside, again, just another DEM, and feed that into our ice flow model where we can simulate a, a glacier extent. And then, you know, sort of following the, the flow chart here, we compare that modeled glacier extent to field-based evidence, our mapping, uh, uh, of glacier shapes. And if the extents don't match, we sort of iteratively uh, redo this process until we get a match. Now that might be kind of hard to visualize, so here's just one other way to, to think about what's happening. On the left-hand side here, I'm showing you a, sort of a, a mass balance grid for Little Cottonwood Canyon for what I would call a plausible last glacial maximum climate. The blue tones are showing you areas of positive mass accumulation or positive snow accumulation, and the warmer tones to the greens are showing you areas of snow melt or ablation. And so we take this mass balance grid alongside a description of topography and feed this into our ice flow uh, model. We simulate the flow of ice from these accumulation areas down into the valley. Um, and then we typically let this model run until it reaches a steady state. We're trying to match a, an ice position um, uh, that, I, that I showed you previously. And so we let this run until the glacier's not changing that much. And in this case, I would say, okay, this is a satisfactory model run. Um, and um, I would call this, this basically done, or that rather the climate that produced this mass balance distribution satisfactorily describes LGM climate in Little Cottonwood Canyon. And so uh, we've done this uh, across the Wasatch uh, in areas where we have, uh, where we think we have good enough mapping and age control uh, for both the LGM shown on the left-hand panel here and uh, for the late glacial shown on the right-hand panel. And we've done this in both um, 
what we call sort of multiple catchment domains shown in panels A on, on, on both, both sides there, uh, where we include multiple drainages in the same, uh, same model run, uh, as well as uh, single catchment model runs where we can sort of more accurately turn the knobs to match uh, uh, glacier positions. And so sort of the, the it's it's nice to be able to reconstruct these these uh, these ancient ice extents, but again, what we're really interested in is is trying to discern climate from these these model runs. And what we end up getting is basically a plot like this. Um, I'm showing you uh, temperature depression on the x-axis as well as a precipitation factor change uh, on the y-axis. Now both of these are relative to modern climate. Um, and this precipitation factor, one would be modern, so 100% of, of modern precipitation, and two would be 200% modern precipitation. And so what you end up, or what you can probably see, is we get this basically non-unique curve of solutions that could adequately recreate these glacial extents. And here I'm showing you both, uh, this is for the LGM, both multiple catchment simulations as well as single catchment uh, simulations. And really what we'd wanna do is uh, limit climate a bit more accurately. So one thing we can do is take advantage of, of previously uh, developed uh, um, lake models, uh, lake reconstructions that use a similar framework to more tightly uh, constrain paleoclimate during these, these time periods. And what's interesting here, or what we're taking advantage of, is the fact that glaciers are particularly sensitive to temperature um, they're also sensitive to precipitation, but lakes are much more sensitive to precipitation changes and less sensitive to temperature. And so we can simply look at um, the intersection of these model curves um, to estimate uh, general paleoclimate conditions for a variety of climate states. Um, and here I'm showing you uh, from Ibarra et al. 2018, uh, Lake Bonneville modeling for the Stansbury uh, shoreline as well as Lake Bonneville high stand, which sort of broadly bracket the um, LGM glacier simulation shown here. So we think it's a good estimate of, of sort of bracketing climate change uh, during this time period. And just by simply uh, looking at the intersection of this, what we can, uh, some conclusions we can make is that uh, temperature depressions during the LGM were, were pretty substantial, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of around uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, with little to no change in precipitation, um, or at least modest changes, if at all. We can repeat this same, uh, this same procedure for late glacial modeling, um, and here I'm showing you um, late glacial reconstructions uh, as the single points and this, this near maxima re-advance in that black curve uh, just a little bit further to the left um, uh, shown there. And, and again, we can compare uh, our, our results to uh, nearby coeval lake reconstructions. So here I'm showing you in the red curve from Ibarra again, um, modeling matching the Provo shoreline from Lake Bonneville, and in blue uh, from nearby Jake's Lake um, from Barth et al. 2016. And now just what's important to remember, there's a pretty big gap between these two curves, is that um, like most people who model Lake Bonneville, the Provo shoreline, uh, they didn't account for overflow uh, at the Provo shoreline. So it's necessarily a minimum estimate of of climate change. So everything would in, in reality have to plot above that red line. So making the, the sort of the Jake's Lake intersection more plausible. And so again, uh, broad sort of conclusions is that the late glacial was warmer than the LGM. That's not surprising. But what is interesting is that it seems to suggest that um, during this time period, there was uh, sort of an increased moisture source uh, during this time period, um, which generally agrees with just the sort of the space-time pattern um, conclusions that we made in the first part of this, uh, this talk with a relatively cold and dry LGM and a, a much wetter period for at least part of the late glacial. Okay, so 
Uh, moving on to something a little bit different, uh, I just want to share some of the results of one of the, the first records we've developed uh, from Timpanogos Cave National Monument where we've been using speleothems as, uh, or trying to use them and see if we can use them as climate archives. So what I think is really interesting uh, about Timpanogos Cave is its position sort of in the continental interior at relatively high elevations. And, and what I think this, this, this lends itself to, or any climate records developed from here uh, lend themselves to, is comparison to other sort of continental high elevation biased records, such as uh, glaciation in the Wasatch, or uh, broadly speaking, in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so here I'm just showing you a photograph looking down the American Fork Canyon. Um, and then, yeah, so just to sort of highlight how high Timpanogos Caves, the caves actually are, they're well over 2,000 meters above, uh, above sea level um, and quite a ways above the American Fork uh, River today. And so um, just sort of a, an overview of, of Timpanogos Cave, again, located in the Wasatch Mountains um, along sort of a north-facing uh, north slope uh, in the American Fork Canyon. And for those of you that haven't been there, it's actually a system of three interconnected caves, uh, including Timpanogos, Hansen, and Middle Caves. And while I'll be the first to admit we really don't know too much about uh, hydrology within the cave or surrounding the caves, um, we can probably pretty confidently say that it's a, a combination of both diffusive as well as sort of fracture flow um, uh, controlled hydrology. Uh, it's pretty variable throughout the cave, but um, hydrology with, between each of the three caves at least correlates, uh, at least we think, with a sort of the variable overburden thicknesses above each of the three caves, with Timpanogos having the greatest and Middle Cave having the least overburden or the smallest overburden thickness. So here um, I'm just showing you a schematic uh, representation of the idea of using a speleothem, in this case a stalagmite, as a paleoclimate proxy record. So uh, on the left-hand side here, I'm showing you, you know, we have precipitation falling above the cave, moving into, moving into the soil. Um, I'm also, so on the right-hand side, I'm not going to go through it, but just showing you sort of pertinent speleogenic uh, reactions. Uh, moving through the soil, through the epic karst, uh, until it eventually enters the cave as drip water. And it's from this drip water uh, that stalagmites, in this case, uh, precipitate from in the cave. And so... Uh, these stalagmites grow up and outwards over time, and the idea is, um, or the fundamental idea, is that, at least for one part of this, is that we can relate the oxygen isotope content in the stalagmite to the oxygen isotope content of precipitation falling above the cave. And now again, this thing is building up through time, so we have this stratigraphy, um, and we can sort of measure the layers as we go through time and track those changes through time. However, uh, as you can see, it's not just precipitation falling uh, and growing a, a stalagmite from that. There's, there's quite a bit of modification in both the soil as well as the epicarst, as well as in the cave itself. So um, the best we can say is that through some, some way, the delta 18O, and here just for, for reference, for those of you that don't think about oxygen isotopes too much, this delta notation is just in, in reference to a, to a standard. Um, the delta 18O of a calcite is somehow related to that of precipitation. And it's related to it through this medium of drip water. And so it becomes really crucial to understand um, the oxygen isotope content of drip water falling in the cave. Um, and again, this is what the stalagmite is precipitating from. So on the plot here, I'm showing you on the left-hand axis, uh, I think, is uh, delta 18O uh, with time on the x-axis uh, for a two-year period from around, I think, July or August 2016 up until August 2018. Um, and so uh, we wanted to understand how different drip water was from precipitation, how it's changing in the cave system. And 
unfortunately, we didn't measure the delta 18 of drip water, but we modeled it in two different ways. Uh, the first way was using, um, some of you might be familiar with the online isotopes in precipitation calculator. This is one of sort of uh, uh, Gabe Bowen's sort of uh, uh, hallmark products at the University of Utah. Uh, and this is shown in the dashed black line uh, or the black lines. And that range between those two black lines is a reflection of the uncertainty in the recharge elevation uh, for drip water or precipitation entering the cave. The other way we estimated the delta 18 of precipitation was by taking uh, measurements of, of rain falling on top of our geology building at the University of Utah and using an elevation dependent projection projected that uh, to, uh, to elevations uh, above the cave system. And again, the error bars there are accounting for uncertainty in the recharge elevation as well as estimated uncertainty in our, uh, our, our sort of modeling technique. Um, and then in the gray bars here, I'm showing you surface temperature uh, near the cave systems. And then lastly, I'm showing you measured drip water from each of the three caves in the yellow, orange, and red um, uh, uh, dots shown here. And sort of the, the main takeaway of all of this is that drip water, if it is at all, is exhibiting an extremely sort of small seasonal signal. Uh, and in fact, it's much closer to um, the uh, volumetrically weighted mean of precipitation uh, falling above the cave. And, and also what we're not showing you here is that there's a strong volumetric bias uh, in drip water to the cool and melt season, in particular the melt season. Um, and so what that means is that uh, drip water delta 18O is, is rep representing some longer term average as opposed to recording seasonal fluctuations. And so in 2016, uh, the National Park Service let us go into the cave and uh, effectively destroy it. And we took cores from uh, two different stalagmites as well as one flowstone. Um, I'm kidding, we didn't destroy it. And we actually did a really, I think, a really good job uh, repairing most of these formations. Um, and through this effort, um, we were able to, again, core two stalagmites, one flowstone, and then we also had access to their sort of archive of previously broken stalagmites and stalactites. So we had seven speleothems to work with in total, and now sort of the trick was how do we find a speleothem that, that was growing during the time period we, we cared about. And so after all that, all that drilling, uh, we ended up going with a uh, already broken stalagmite so at least for now, a lot of work for nothing. Um, and I, I'm not showing you here sort of the, the, the very many um, uh, dates that we got on stalagmites um, just to find one that broadly covered a period we were interested in. And again, so I'm talking about, about uh, uh, dates here. Uh, in order to date these, we used a, a, a uranium series technique. Uh, in particular, it's a thorium daughter deficiency technique. And basically, the way this works is uh, uranium is relatively uh, soluble and mobile in most surface water conditions, whereas thorium is relatively immobile. And so uranium is readily incorporated into the structure of calcite um, where we have very little or ideally no thorium precipitating with the calcite and we can measure the ingrowth of thorium uh, since the time of, of precipitation. And so what we end up having is a, we've set up a chronometer uh, telling us the time of when that calcite precipitated. And so here I'm showing you stalagmite TC4 that we worked with. Um, uranium thorium ages are shown on these uh, little white, uh, white circles. Um, and so I'll mostly be focusing on the period between uh, this 13.6 and 10.6 thousand years ago. And each of these black lines uh, represents a, a transect for uh, stable isotope analyses. And you'll notice that they're shifting. And what we've tried to do there is because of the exceptionally well-preserved laminations in this stalagmite, um, we can actually track that um, the growth axis was shifting over time. Uh, and for reasons I won't get into, we kind of want to stay on, on that growth axis. 
And so uh, sort of the, you know, if we're going to build a paleoclimate record, we need to have a good chronometer. And so I'm showing you depth on the y-axis, age on the x-axis on the, the left-hand plot. And the main takeaway here is I believe we do have a good, a good chronology. We have no intractable age reversals. And so we sort of moved ahead with building this paleoclimate record. And so here uh, I'm showing you sort of the, the first results uh, from this TC4 record. I'm showing you delta 18O on this, uh, this top panel with respect to age. Uh, and on the bottom panel, I'm showing you uh, uh, changes in growth rate um, as deduced by the U series ages on the bottom panel. And without getting into too much detail, I think we can we can sort of uh, broadly interpret the delta 18O as reflecting uh, a change in the partitioning of uh, um, annual precipitation with lower values, meaning a, a greater amount of precipitation falling in the winter relative to summer, um, and with higher delta 18O values showing or indicating less winter precip. Uh, growth rate. Um, likely reflects a, a combination of increased drip rate or increased flux into the cave of precipitable materials, as well as possibly uh, increased uh, soil CO2, particularly summer production, which would allow the stalagmite to grow uh, throughout the, the summer season. Um, and so uh, interpreted in unison, we can actually see that um, we have at least two periods where we have these spikes in growth rate and decreases in delta 18O, which would be sugge or suggest, we think, um, uh, increased winter uh, precipitation and probably increased total precipitation. Um, and this happens sort of at the onset of the, the younger dryas, um, where you can see this this sort of dramatic drop in, in delta 18O values around 12.7 thousand years ago. And then uh, interestingly, we see a similar sort of spike in the uh, earliest Holocene. And while I don't really have time to go over all of the, uh, like all of the, the modeling and proxy record comparisons, broadly speaking, I think the record that we've developed at Timpanogos shows uh, pretty distinct similarities, in particular to other Western North America speleothem records, um, such as uh, in the Sierra Nevada, um, which I'm showing you here on, on panel C. Uh, and in particular, what they, what they seem to show is this lack of an abrupt transition from the Pleistocene into the Holocene. And, and for comparison, uh, on this bottom panel here, I'm showing you again, uh, like in the beginning of the talk, this Greenland uh, ice core record where we can see this dramatic increase in delta 18O um, around 11.7 thousand years ago, where in Western North America, it doesn't seem like we see that dramatic of a change. Um, and also not shown here is that, insofar as we know anyways, this early Holocene wet period seems to be coincident with this uh, uh, Gilbert episode of the Great Salt Lake during uh, the early Holocene, although I, I'll be sort of the first to admit that we need to do quite a bit more work in, in pinning down the, the age of that, um, which, which, would, which would certainly help interpreting uh, our record here. Um, and again, like I, I mentioned before, uh, in panel D here, our record is you know, one of the few continental high elevation records that really lends itself to helping uh, interpret uh, Western North America glacial episodes uh, in these, uh, these continental uh, high elevation settings. I'm showing you that on, on, on panel D, and you can see it's, it's relatively confusing in that if you account for the, the error that I've shown you uh, here, this entire period is just one big glacial episode, which uh, may or may not be correct. Um, and so, um, and then I guess just finally, um, it sort of suggests that during some periods we're connected to North Atlantic climate change, such as uh, during the Younger Dryas, where we see this dramatic drop in Delta 18O, or you know at least a, a per mil drop, maybe not too dramatic. Um, but during other periods, such as the early Holocene, it doesn't look that similar to, to Greenland. So Western North America is kind of doing its own thing, um, which isn't too surprising. 
And so, uh, in summary, um, we sort of developed this uh, range-wide glacial chronology in the Wasatch, and we think that we've sort of determined that the, the range was behaving broadly synchronously, uh, suggesting that it was responding to, uh, uh, to broad-scale climate forcings, and that this, this space-time pattern, as well as our modeling, suggests that the LGM in, in uh, the Wasatch was cold and with little change in precipitation and was followed by a warmer and wetter period during the late glacial. And this is just hopefully the first of many speleothem records uh, that we'll develop from Timpanogos Cave. Uh, and they seem to be recording or faithfully recording past climate change uh, and that it records sort of variable climate conditions during this uh, interglacial glacial transition. And so um, I just need to thank uh, long list of uh, uh, people that helped, as well as um, uh, a variety of funding sources, including especially uh, multiple uh, GSA research grants, uh, and as well as most of the, the Cosmo, the, the Cosmogenic dating you've seen here was sort of graciously funded by seed grants from Purdue University's Prime Lab. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the sort of the simplest answer, like why it would disconnect itself from North Atlantic climate. I mean, the 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 simple answer is you have to come up with these. I don't want to say extravagant, but you have to come up with sort of far-reaching, you know, what everyone calls now teleconnections to North Atlantic climate. How do I how do I transfer whatever is going on there to Western North America? And typically, it's just a it's a really large uh, um, it's just a large distance to to traverse. The other thing, though, is that it it's it's particularly it becomes harder, I think to make those connections um, the further you get away from uh, the last, last glacial maximum. And the reason I say that is that um, with ice sheets at their fullest extent, they have a pretty pronounced impact on, on climate uh, and they're, they're fairly, uh, well, let's just stick with Western North America. Um, you know, they're, they're much closer. And so the effects there, the effects that those could be having um, it's a lot easier to explain those teleconnections. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just a function of, of, of distance and, um, and then f the other big thing is that most c m when most people suggest a teleconnection, a connection to Western North America and the North Atlantic, one of the only ways right now we can test this is through modeling, um, which is a good start through sort of general circulation modeling, but we need to set up questions where we can go and, and sort of physically test this, whether it's through, um, you know, like a, a good example, I don't know if you're familiar with, you know, we were able to sort of, uh, uh, we have geochemical proxy records to uh, assess the changing of, of uh, um, Atlantic over overturning currents through time or circulation through time. Um, and that allows us, um, you know, th those physically based proxy records are what needed to validate any modeling teleconnections. So uh, hopefully that's the direction we're moving in. Um, and we just need to think of like sort of the, the right, the right, uh, uh, the right questions to ask and the right tools to use. Rich. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I'm seeing is rain and some cotton wood at the same time in this log and stuff that's pretty close. Yeah, right? It's pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. So my, my question is, for a less large log, where is the thermal environment for at that same time it's processing, where is the rain position going to get on this log? Is it at Hogham Fork or is it higher up the chain somewhere? Well, it's got to be higher than Hogham Fork. And the reason I say that is that if you just look at the uh, the shape of the Hogham Fork Moraine, yeah. 
I mean, it, it's it's I mean, it's this beautiful, beautiful moraine that is basically at the bottom of what would have been basically an ice fall. Um, and there's no indication from the geomorphology that we have other ice sort of butting up against it. Um, otherwise, you'd think maybe the moraine would be oriented more east-west, but it's sort of perfectly north-south. So that's that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there, well, yeah, no, I mean, there's certainly more moraines to date, um, um, but yeah, I didn't see any, any definitive, there are moraines higher up valley that, um, well, things that have been mapped as moraines higher up valley, um, like kind of near Snowbird, but for me, especially with the modeling, that seems really high up for the main trunk glacier to, to be at when Hogham Fork is, is there. Um, I mean, there's, th it doesn't have to deposit a moraine, um, and also uh, maybe it was buried by the white pine rock avalanche, who knows, so yeah. Seems like it, yeah. So is that an implied that the, the volume of the, the, the water and the volume of ice is pulling it into what the yeah. ice is? Exactly, yeah. And um, I'm trying to, I, I know for uh, uh, Ben Lobb uh, and a student did some work with this. I don't know if they ever published it. Cause it's, I mean, it's a it's an interesting question just to, to sort of uh, do the do the math real quick, but I know they had a, a, a GSA poster. We're just looking at the broad, broad scale volumes of even ice in the Western Uintas plus the Wasatch. And it's such a small percentage of Lake Bonneville that, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it's so minuscule as to be insignificant. So it's just a change in perspective that I think is part of the exploration of the level rise and fall. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's obviously a function of precipitation as well as a change in evaporation. Um, but yeah, so it, it's much more uh, affected by, by these broader scale uh, climate changes. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, so one, actually one thing I didn't mention but I think it said on the slide is our, our um, particularly our, our, our LGM and, and even the, the, the Provo sort of scenario is that one thing that's complicated here is that um, the Wasatch could have experienced sort of, could have experienced different precipitation rates than the aggregate of Lake Bonneville as a whole, right? Um, or at least relative percentage wise. Um, I, I think it seems plausible that, that it contributed some lake effect precipitation. In fact, this, when I started my PhD, I was like, I'm gonna find this out, I'm gonna put a number on it. I didn't do any of that. And, uh, cause it's a really hard thing to, to get at. And I was hoping I could use speleothems to track uh, evaporative, evaporative change or evaporative um, uh, moisture sources but it's really hard to find speleothems uh, that are growing during the LGM because it's really cold. Um, I mean, one other thing we just might want to consider is that, um, and more work should be done on this, but um, is how, if it really was that cold, and it's more than just my work that suggests it's cold. I mean, there's Daryl Kaufman's amino acid uh, work. There's uh, clumped isotope stuff from, um, uh, John Maring um, that suggests it was really quite a bit colder. And so one question I would immediately ask is how often did the lake freeze over? Um, or how much did it freeze over and what parts and how would that affect it? But that's sort of another line of inquiry. We don't have an exact number. Um, it certainly did affect it. And in more ways than just precipitation, it certainly altered the, the thermal conditions uh, around the lake in a similar way that the Great Lakes do today, right? So it'd be really interesting for someone to, and uh, Hostetler did model this in the 90s, um, but maybe at a finer scale looking at 
how far that that really affected, uh, especially as we move up in elevation pretty dramatically in the Wasatch. So. Yeah, so if I can if I can reframe the question a little bit is is, is and and tell me if this is right is that I'm I'm measuring drip water today and I'm I have to make this interpretation that like yeah they were it was it was similar enough um, in the past and therefore I'm assuming that the flow pathways were were similar. Um, my guess is it probably wasn't, but I you know we and this is this is sort of a um, a caveat. Well, in that case, this time period's a bit short to to really account for sort of uh, to account for those delta eighteen o uh, changes. But with longer records, um, people have done exactly that to track um, elevation change through time. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slide goes by too fast. Yeah. <laughs> I got to get this in my head. But, but when did really Lake Bonneville get the big change? Well, I mean, so. Down to the level of Great Salt Lake. Climatically, it was controlled around, I mean, it abandoned the Provo level around 15,000 years ago, insofar as we know. Um, what, what was that? Yeah, the changes between Provo and Gilbert. So in th it dropped below the Gilbert shoreline and then. Um, um, drop below the Gilbert, and then during this like early Holocene whatever period, it bumped back up real quick, and then um, so in fact during parts of it, there seems to be I'm not a big lake guy, but there's evidence that it was even that it could have been lower than uh, Great Salt Lake levels, um, but m major climatic desiccation around 15,000 years ago, and you know before that around 18,000 years ago was the flood, which. But it couldn't. It couldn't because it was overflowing at the Provo. So, okay. Okay. so that's okay. why the modeling's a minimum, a minimum estimate. And you, I don't know. If you might have seen some people sort of interpretive uh, hydrographs of if Lake Bonneville didn't catastrophically flood, they draw this nice little hump with the rest of Western North America pluvial lakes, and they're like, yeah, that's what it should have been. So. Um, but we don't know because it went from being a closed basin lake to to, to an open basin still. Yeah. <laughs> 